We started this study in Romans 8 three weeks ago. This will be our fourth uh, run at what many people consider to be the most powerful, the crescendo of the gospel in Romans 8. So um, each week we've built on the theme. Last week we left off with being set free from the bondage of fear, knowing that it's not that fear is lying to us and that there's fear is going to always just we overcome it by avoiding suffering, but that God can actually do something in our suffering to bring us through it into glory. And now we build on last week's message in Romans 8, starting in verse 18. So read along with me as you have turned your Bibles there. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered now. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And now we come to maybe the most comforting, the most powerful verse in the Bible. The truth that is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I'm going to read it again because it is where we will be in our study this morning, trying to understand what God is doing to take us to the other side of our fear through suffering. We come to Romans 8 verse 28 that says, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. This passage of scripture is like medicine in the medicine chest of truth of the word. It is used for all of the difficult and challenging circumstances of our lives when we don't quite know how to make sense of what we're going through. We come to Romans 8 verse 28 and it comes like medicine for us. It says, listen, all things will work together for good. It's so comforting. And we start by saying in this passage, in this truth of this promise, all really does mean all for our lives. And I say that because sometimes in the way that we use speech, in figures of speech, we sometimes limit the full definition of a word to not really mean what it is actually saying. Like the word all, we don't always mean all when we say it. Have you ever noticed that? We can say, I worked all day long. And in reality, we didn't really go all day long. It's part of the day, right? Or maybe the more exciting expression, I slept all morning long. And we really didn't sleep all morning. We woke up and it was, it went about our day. Or maybe the season of life that specifically my wife is in. The baby was up all night. Right? And for that one, I'm like, yes, you are right. That is true. I don't want to argue that. I want to give you full credit for what you've been through to take care of that baby. But we limit the use of the word, and sometimes we, we come to a passage like this and say, do we really mean all? Does it really mean the boring and the mundane and the uninteresting and the uninspired days and the rainy days and the really hard days? Does it really even mean the suffering? And to that, we 
started with Romans 8, verse 18 for a reason, because it is fully connected to the reassurance of where we started. For I consider that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Why? Because even suffering is attached to all things. Now that is uncomfortable to hear sometimes. And as much as we need to be people who can encourage one another. And as a pastor, I need to know that when I meet someone who is in so much pain and they're struggling, they have the burden of suffering on their shoulders, that I can say to them with truth and hope, Romans 8, 28, all things will work together for good is for you right now. As comforting it is to know that I can pass it out, it is sometimes so hard to receive it. When you're going through the storm and someone says, don't worry, that's going to work out. You know what you want to say? No, it won't. Not this. This hurts, and this is painful, and this is taking me to the brink of what I understand, and I do not like it. Because oftentimes what we want to do is say, this is what's good, and this is what's bad in our lives. And what Romans 8.28 is forcing us to do is to open our hearts and our minds to the possibility that what we label as bad might actually be good, and that can be frustrating. It can be hard sometimes to look at something that has caused us pain and has broken our hearts and has taken us to places in our lives that are so troubling and trying and say, that's going to be good. It's asking us to go beyond our own understanding, to go beyond what makes sense to us. It's asking us to completely change our mind about such an obvious, hurtful thing. And where we have to start in this is to open up our hearts and our minds to the door of possibility that maybe we aren't very good at identifying what is good. Maybe good things aren't as obvious as we think. That's where we have to start. If we can't be open to that, there's no way we can change our hearts and our minds about suffering. But it's possible. Is it possible? That's one of the themes of Romans. It actually starts in the very beginning of the book that is taking us to our need for a Savior by doing what? By saying, Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and fallen short of God's perfection and glory. In other words, to say, you're not good. You can't save yourself. No amount of religious law and good works and trying harder and doing better will ever make you good. Change your mind about what you think about your own righteousness. And when you do, you'll realize that you need a Savior. And just as sure as we have to change our mind about our own goodness so that we can receive the goodness of God on our behalf, we also have to change the way that we have perspective on what we think is even good, on what we label as the good stuff in our life and what we label as the stuff that we just need to avoid or circumvent or get around because it's obviously bad. And, you know, history is really a lesson in this. We have this thing called revisionist history or 2020 hindsight vision, when we look back on things throughout history, it's often a comedy of errors where you look and you think, what was that person thinking throughout history? Why did that group of people decide to do this certain thing? Why did that leader or that president or that uh, person go in that area thinking it was good? It was clearly bad. Now we know. Here's an example of that in a way that will point us to the comedy of errors. In India, there was once a widespread belief that tobacco was good for your teeth. And that belief resulted into the genius invention called toothpaste tobacco. <laughs> Put a little tobacco, a little whitening, and you brush your teeth with tobacco. It was only until recently that the Indian Supreme Court upheld a 1992 ban imposed by the union government to outlaw tobacco toothpaste. Now, at some point in the history of people cultivating the, to the tobacco plant, someone thought, why don't we just start rubbing this on our teeth? Now, with our revisionist history, we look at that and say, how silly is that, that they could ever think that that was good for their teeth? Because what we know about tobacco is it actually makes your teeth brown and rot your teeth. A warning for anyone who is wrestling with tobacco. It's bad for your teeth definitely don't just rub it on there. <laughs> and we laugh, and we think, how silly that someone once thought that was good. And now, the lesson gets slightly more acute because I'm going to ask you what you think the good things in your life are. 
what are the things in your life that are the ingredients and the building blocks of the good life? What are they? And how about we take that thought experiment a step further by trying to think back to how you would have answered that question 10 years ago. If you could go back in time and talk to the person in the mirror that represents the decade old you, or the decade ago you, what would they have answered that question? So let me use myself as a way to try to navigate how sometimes good is not obvious. Here's what was good, how I would have answered that question in my life 10 years ago. I definitely would have said the girl that I was dating because the relationship was blossoming. It was thriving. We were in the honeymoon stage of getting to know each other, and we were having a blast. So definitely my girlfriend, and I also would have said my job. I love my job. It's a good job. It provides for me the ability to do things with uh, extra income like travel and hang out. And I have a very nice lifestyle provided for the economy that I live in because of my job. Great job. And I would have said maybe my group of friends, my circle of friends that I hung out with between those three things, my girlfriend and my job and my friends, they pretty much absorbed all my time. And for the most part, they filled me with happiness and contentment. Great things good things. There they are. Now, fast forward 10 years, and here I am talking to you in the present day. And let's think about those things now in my life. What do those things look like? Well, let me start by saying the girl that I referenced, her name is not Daniela. (laughs) Daniela is my wife, which means that relationship came actually kind of abruptly crashing to an end in a way that really broke my heart. A good thing turned on its head to hurt me. And the job that I have, if you think about what happened 10 years ago, was right around 2007, 2008, when many jobs went up in smoke. There was a thing in our country called the Great Recession that cost a lot of people their jobs, and I was one of them. And it left me with more debt than I had money to pay, expecting that I would always have a job. And so all of a sudden, the girl that was good broke my heart, and the job that was good broke my bank account, and the friends that were good, still great people in my life, but they don't have anything to do with my normal day-to-day activity today. So what we have in a quick 10 years, a decade, a decade of lessons, is this. What I thought was good wasn't so obvious, because some of those good things actually turned out to really hurt me. What's good in your life? Are you sure that you are really good at labeling and identifying and knowing what is good. And here's how we take all of this a step further. And here's how we start walking through the lens of Romans 8, 28, that all things actually are going to be good. If we sometimes mislabel what we think are good things that turn on their heads and hurt us, is it possible? And you have to be open to this possibility. Is it possible, maybe, hard things? or tough things, and I mean really tough things, maybe even suffering could also be mislabeled as bad. Is that possible in our lives? And so let me take the examples that I already shared a step further. As I look back on those 10 years and I think about the lessons that I came from, the tough stuff, the girl that broke my heart also broke my spirit and caused me to open up to the reality of something deeper than a relationship that I could find with just one girl. And the unemployment that broke my bank account also broke my pride, and I opened up myself to something that was bigger than my own plans and my own hopes and my own dreams. And it started pointing me towards a path of some hunger for something that was more meaningful. And maybe in your own recollection, as you start thinking about these lessons in your lives, you can start identifying some things that went from good to bad to better. And that is what we're getting at, but we're not quite there yet. Because Romans 8.28 is asking us to at least open our hearts to the reality that tough stuff can actually be good for you. But I think we all already know that. I think it's not outside of any of our realm of even experience in this world to know that some things have been really hard, but they've been worth it. It's the classic no pain, no gain, right? When you get into that gym, it's going to be a really tough hour workout. It's going to be a really tough three months. You're going to wake up sore, and you're going to have to cut out carbs, which is horrible, because carbs is donuts. (laughs) But at the end of the training— At the end of the sore mornings, at the end of the the diet that you were committed to, you have the reward of a healthy and finessed body. That's good. You can get the no pain, no gain. 
lesson in that. And the college students among us, you are in the season right now where you are going into those late nights of studying and you're living off top ramen and you live in a weird dorm setup that is kind of hard to navigate sometimes. But after four years of living on the brink of poverty, you're going to have a career and it'll be worth it, right? Right. Don't give up. And when we start to see the story make sense, we can try to navigate suffering. I was actually reading a story not long ago, um, and I'll share it with you now because it is part of this picture, but it doesn't take us far enough. There was a cyclist, a, a kind of a world-class cyclist, living out his passion. Imagine loving uh, riding a, a cycle, a bike, and getting to do it for your life, and it's per, it's providing income for you and is allowing you to travel the world, do what you love and you never work a day in your life, right? And that's what he was doing. He was a professional cyclist until in one particular race, he gets in a bike accident and it's horrible. It's gruesome. It breaks his body. Multiple bones are broken. He goes to the hospital. He gets the report from the doctor and among all of the breaks and pains, there's a horrible report that one of his legs is so badly broken that he will probably never walk without a limp, let alone ever ride a bike again. This passion for this thing that he was doing that defined his life and provided for him looks like it's going to be just gone. And then there's a twist to the story, of course, right? This is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the twist in the story because who should walk through the door in the hospital room except for a nurse that turns out to be someone that they've come to find out they have a lot in common. And her room visits turn into these long conversations about life and about common interests. And eventually they realize that they really like each other and they fall in love. And then they get married. And this bike accident that looks so tragic has turned into something beautiful. And that is part of this hope that maybe good things that go bad can go back to good again. But I don't, what we don't want to do is to look to Romans 8 as some sort of guide into how you can wait for that next little turn in your story to where it's just all going to work out. Because the reality is, is that some of the suffering that's represented in this room right now doesn't have a clear ending to it. This is the challenge. With revisionist history, we can sometimes see how good goes bad, and we can sometimes see how bad goes good, and we can see that the gym turns into a nice body, and we can see the bike accident turns into a marriage. But what happens, and this is the question of the hour, what happens when we're stuck in between? What happens for those of us who don't quite see what's on the other side yet? This is the real struggle for suffering, and it is the real problem that needs to be addressed. It is not just to say that it's going to all work out. It's to give you an answer for the in-between zone, because this is the, this is the big challenge for those of us who have this message hitting home way too close right now. What are you supposed to do right now to make sense of the hurt and the pain and the heartbreak and the trial? And suffering brings you to the edge of that. That's why oftentimes when you come to these seasons and you think about the broken friendship or the broken relationship or the broken bank or the broken hope and the broken dream, what's the first question that you want to ask? Why? Why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? Why is it happening now? Why God? Because you're stuck in between. What do we do when you feel like you're stuck in the gap of God's goodness? Because we know what we do, how to respond to God's goodness. We know how to thank him for the things that we have. But what do we do when we feel like God's goodness was here and maybe someday it'll be somewhere? We're stuck right here. That's the question. The gap in the detail of your lives is something that Romans 8.28 wants to come in and answer. What do you do when you're stuck in between? And to begin to look for an answer, I actually want to look to a common criticism just in belief in God in general. There is a common criticism that uh, that really nicely contrasts this gap in your story, and it's called the God of the gaps. It's a criticism that's usually brought out in the way that people of faith have to interact with science and discovery. And the God of the gaps criticism goes like this. When you theists, when you believers in God, can't explain something, all you do is say, well, God must have done it. And so you take a gap in your understanding, and you just say, well, God did that. 
And a crude version of this, an outdated version of this, but valid nonetheless, would be thunder and lightning. What causes thunder and lightning? Remove your 21st century understanding and just think about being in nature and, uh, and seeing this phenomenon of light falling from the sky and sound in the air that has no correlated cause to it. What's going on? And so the God of the gap insertion would be this. That sound that's unexplainable and that light that we have no idea where it came from is the voice of an angry God. That's what's happening there. We just insert God and in things we can't understand. The problem with that argument goes like this. Now, we do understand. Science with great detail can tell us what causes lightning and what causes thunder. So you have just removed any kind of necessary need for God there. And you give the God of the gaps argument enough time, and the things you can't understand will eventually be understood, and the gaps will be filled, and eventually there'll be no need for God. If you come across that argument, and as we start building to try to find the answer for our own gap seasons, here's the answer. It's, I'm going to quote John Lennox, who is a mathematician. So he's in the scientific world, and he's also a theologian. So he's representing God or faith in God in the scientific community. And so he responds to the God of the gap criticism. This is what he says. We do not believe in a God of the gaps. We actually believe in the God of of the whole story. We believe in the God of the thunder and lightning because we believe in the God that created the entirety of the heavens and the earth, thunder and lightning included. And then he tells a story of Isaac Newton to give us a better understanding of this taken to a, uh, the next step. When Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravitation, he didn't say, ah, now that I understand how that planet moves, I don't need to believe in God. Not at all. In fact, the more he understood the planetary motion, the more he worshiped God who had created the planets in such a clever way. He wasn't saying, I can't explain it, so therefore God did it. He was saying, I can explain it to a very small extent. And what I can explain is so wonderful that it is evidence of a wonderful creator. His worship for God increased by what he understood, not what he didn't understand. Here's what we're getting at. When we see the gaps in the story through the scientific lens, the answer isn't, well, we'll just have to insert God here. The answer is, there is a discovery waiting to happen in this gap that will further give evidence for the God that was at the very beginning of creation. To understand why those gaps exist, you don't have to have the details in the moment. You just have to know that there is a God of the whole story that is above even the gaps. And that is the beginning of what Romans 8 is pointing us to. That's why in verse 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the Creator eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility. Paul, in this letter, is saying, think back to the very beginning of the story of God. God created a good world, and it unraveled in the futility of fallen man. This story goes all the way back to the beginning. And when we find the discovery in the gaps of science, every time we see some new form of the universal language of math, or we learn something about the code of life found in DNA, or we learn about the intricacy of the planetary motion. It's all just a new discovery in the brilliant and good and creative God at the beginning of the story that put it all into motion. And we have to know that that is the answer, not just for the God of the gaps in science, but it is for the God of the gaps in suffering as well. And it is a contrasted argument, but they go as two ends of the same spectrum. The God of the gaps of science says where you can't explain it, just insert God. Now, the God of the gaps of your suffering, the missing details that we're still waiting for, what is this going to turn out like? Why is this happening? The gap that exists there, here's how the God of the gaps of the suffering goes. Where suffering exists in that gap, God is absent. You just remove any form of God's goodness or any form in, of hope that God could do something because where suffering exists, it's a gap in the story where he's absent. And we say, no, the answer is the same for this side of the spectrum as well. We don't believe in a God of the gaps. We believe in a God of the whole story. 
and the missing details of your life that you have to navigate when suffering hits, when hard times go, you have to go through hard times, what that is actually pointing you to is just your next moment of discovery for the goodness of God. Every wave of the goodness of God, every new form of grace that you walk in to experience, that every good and perfect thing in your life is from God, is, is showing you the God of the whole story that has given you a preview to the end. Science points us to the beginning, and your suffering, replacing it with goodness, points you to the end of the story. God is the God of the whole story. And our suffering just gives us a reminder that he's not quite done writing it. And this is what hope means. This is what it means to have hope. Verse 24, we are saved in this hope, but hope that is not seen isn't hope. Hope that waits for things that we can grasp to. Hope that says, okay, I've got to see who's walking through that door to make certain sense of the suffering. That's not hope. Hope is hoping for what is going to happen. And when you have hope, this is what it looks like. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with perseverance. You cannot get to Romans 8, 28 without hope that God is writing us day by day, glory by glory, goodness by goodness, more and more and more to the end of the glorious story that he is writing. And the end of the story is his total goodness conquering all of the suffering. If you go to the end of the word, it will take you to a book in Revelation that points us to what Romans 8.28 is going to be a fulfillment of when it says in Revelation 21, there will be no more tears. There will be no more suffering. God will be with his people and he will reveal the sons and the daughters. That's what Romans 8.28 has to point us to. And so here's how we leave here. Here's how we take Romans 8.28 and apply it to our life. It is not to say, give me the details every time I'm stuck in the gap. It is to say this. There is no gap in the story. Your suffering does not mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that God is somehow not a part of your life anymore. He's not working on you still. He's somehow removed his hand of blessing and goodness from your life. Suffering represents a discovery of God's goodness that you're waiting for. Hope says we eagerly wait we cannot wait to see the next line of discovery. What's it going to be like? We look around and we hear the stories. And I want to assure you that the common thread for every one of us in here is not the good life now, but it is the suffering that God is helping us navigate and writing our story to the good life that he has for us. We all have to face it. And I get extra front row seats to this because I get to meet with people who need prayer and they need counsel and they need to hear the word of God as medicine to their souls. And if I just gave you the details of my last week, it would be such a, an example of the reality that every single one of us need to know what to do with the why. I met with someone who came in and said, I have just maxed out every credit card and I am so worried about telling my wife, what am I supposed to do now? I feel so burdened by this thing that I did. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. That's just a sting of suffering. You know what we say to him? We can't wait to see what God is going to do. This story is going to unravel a new discovery in God's goodness. I met with someone, grown woman, came to the foot of the stage. I need prayer for something that happened to me when I was 12 years old. Still feel the sting the tremors of a pain that happened to me two decades ago. And we insert the story of hope. We cannot wait for the discovery of how that's going to turn out. There's going to be some sort of radical discovery in your life that will show you how the 12-year-old hurt and the pain that exists in your heart is being weaved together to some radical goodness in your life. Someone called with a marriage on the brink. Someone called with addiction just weighing down on them prayer for the heartbreak of friends who aren't talking. And I want to give this message very clearly to any of you who came here because you're a lover of God. That's the qualification of this. For those of you 
who love God and any of you who believe in the perfect will of God for your life, we take all of the why, we take all of the hurt, we take all of the pain, we take all of the suffering, and we eagerly wait for the discovery of goodness. That is what Romans 8, 28 is pointing us to. You have to believe in the God of the whole story. And then we need this reminder that the 10 verses that we read from 18 to 28 are a picture of creation from the beginning until the end. It points out that all of creation is eagerly waiting. And then in verse 29, it says, for him he foreknew, it goes all the way down to he glorified, the glory that God is pulling us all into. There is an arc of the whole story of God in the passage of scripture that we read, and it is very clear that it is telling us that we're in the middle of it. We're not in the beginning, and we're not in the end. We are in the middle of the story. We are in the eager expectation, perseverance, not giving up to see how God will work out the middle story to get to the end story. Every single one of you, I can say without a shadow of the doubt, you are still in the middle of the story of God's goodness in your life. You have not reached your end. And here's the really good news that the Bible from the beginning Genesis to the end, Revelation, is full of all of these ways that God interacts with humans and gives us these stories. It is a book of stories, after all. And it shows us how God takes these circumstances that happen in the middle of people's lives, and he can flip them on their heads to take the bad and make them good. That is the theme of the Bible. Let me share a couple with you now. We are in our midweek service. You are all invited to going through the book of Esther. It is a story of tragedy turning into hope, turning into goodness, and turning into the glory of God. Esther was an orphan. Think about those details. No parents on her own, but there's someone in her family that loves her and cares for her, and she's an orphan living in a foreign land. She lives during the period of captivity for the nation of Israel. She's living as a Jewish person in the Persian Empire. These details are hard, and they cause difficulty and challenge, but God's sovereign hand lifts her up, and in ways that only he can do, he positions her into the high-ranking authority of queen in that kingdom. And while she's queen, she's used by God at risk of her own life to save her people from ethnic cleansing. And God takes her through this season of danger and risk, and he gets her to the other side where she stays queen, and she's responsible for the salvation of her people in the way that God worked in her life. Good story. Ended great. Case study of Job. It is the story of suffering. Job is a man who has to answer the question for all of us, can someone really love God after they've been stripped of everything? Can someone who loses his loved one, his families, his family, his livestock, his livelihood, his possessions, his own health, and he gets stripped of everything, can he still believe that God is good? And at the end of that story, this interaction that he has with the creator of the universe, he comes to still believe and everything is restored 100-fold in Job's life. Good story that went bad, that became glorious. And then maybe the most famous example of this, if you're looking for hope in the examples of real lives in the Bible, you look to the person of Joseph, prince of Egypt. How did he get to Egypt as a Jewish man? Sold into slavery by his brothers who hated him. Given over. And while he was there, before he was elevated by God to the position where God used him to save his people, he was in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Spent years wondering about his fate. And yet, classically, the resolution of that story is that the brothers who once hated him and sold him to slavery would come to him and bow at his feet, asking for help. Reconciliation would happen. God uses the position of Joseph to save a famine for the the land of the Jews. It's a good story. The end of it, Genesis, that gives us this story, says what man intended for evil, God used for good. It is a story of how God flips all suffering and all evil and on trial on its head. 
And the Bible is full of the stories. And I share all of those stories, not as a way to give you an example of something to even aspire to in this life, because Esther and Job and Joseph are not the example. Those stories are still the middle story because all of the Bible is pointing us to the example of one story that gives us the ultimate hope for all of this. And that is the story that we are being called to imitate. It is the story that is pointed out in verse 29 that says, for who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Jesus is the example of ultimate suffering turning into ultimate joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, the shame, the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders. And how did his story end? If you don't believe in the God of the whole story, you might think it ended tragically. tragically. His disciples did because the story of Jesus went suffering all the way to the point of death. And for three days, everyone who was following him was depressed because they were thinking that the story that works out together for good would somehow happen maybe more similar to Joseph. Maybe it'll just end with a really good, nice ending right here and right now. You can be king, you can be queen, you have a kingdom, you have a crown, you have a little palace. Unless we think that that is what Romans 8.28 points us to, I remind you that what God is doing to work all things together for good will always be part of your story until you come all the way to the other side of this life. And don't believe any preacher or theology that tells you differently. Because some people will look at this verse and they will say, Romans 8.28, God wants to bless you. God wants to give you good stuff. God wants to take bad stuff and make it good and you can have it right now. You can have it yesterday according to the power of your faith. The good stuff is waiting for you. You just got to give and you can't outgive God. And the good stuff, the all things together for good will come in the form of a bigger paycheck, a bigger house, a bigger closet, a bigger lifestyle, a first class ticket to the good life. That is what God is waiting to do for you. And the reality of that is, is we've got to be people who believe that we are called according to God's purpose. And his purpose is not to put the winds in your sail for a nice 80 years on this life. His purpose is not to give you the most amazing workflow and the most amazing plan to retirement and the most amazing comfort and pleasures of this world. His purpose is to conform you into the image of his son. And anyone who wants to go into that image, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. Not pick up your crown. Pick up your cross and follow me. The example is someone who lived out the story until death, and that is what it means to have Romans 8.28, a reality in your life. If you are waiting for the details and the missing parts of your story to be finished until you get to the other side, you will be disappointed. Because for the rest of your life, you will live in a world that has fallen and is troubled and will have trials, it will have good seasons, it will have tough seasons. And the middle story of your life is not completed until you see God face to face. And don't ever give up until you do. This is what we hope for. The next discovery of God's goodness is still pointing us to the end of the story. The perseverance is pointing us to run a race that we do not give up on until we get to the other side of this life. The cross is the example of ultimate suffering turned into ultimate joy. Don't settle for anything less. Let me read you what Malcolm Muggridge says about the cross as a beacon of the example of suffering, working all things together for good. Muggridge was a British author, brilliant author, was agnostic until his 60s. He didn't believe in God. He did not believe. He didn't know what he believed. And this is what he says after God reaches into his life and captures him into the theology that he can work everything together for good. This is what Muggridge says. Contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned 
in my 75 years in this world, everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness. Thus, of course, this is what the cross signifies. And it is the cross more than anything else that has called me to be a believer in Jesus. It is not the riches. It is not the momentary blessings that will somehow outbalance the momentary sufferings of this world. It is the tough stuff. It is the really hard things. It is the broken heart that God wants to heal. It is the broken plan that God wants to insert his perfect will into. It is even the broken body that God wants to show you his strength through that will ultimately point you more and more to his goodness. Do you believe it? Are you willing to be someone who believes that you will someday look back on your life and say it was the desolating, the hard, and the tough that brings me now the most satisfaction for what God did to reveal the next discovery of his goodness in my life. That is what God is calling us to. And the application of this is to live radically for God. To not avoid suffering so that you can maintain some sort of false idea of a painless and comfortable life. Because remember, the timid promises of this world to give you something good can be flipped on their heads and turned out to be something bad. But I want to tell you this. God can use those things that turned out bad, and he can turn them into something glorious. Live for that. Don't avoid people as an attempt to avoid suffering because I can promise you this. Our purpose is to love God and to love people and people will break your heart. People will hurt you and people will lie to you and people will let you down. And through all of those experiences, God will teach you what it means to eventually love your enemies. Don't miss that lesson. Don't avoid people. Don't avoid the community of believers who is full of all of its ups and downs and hardships and suffering as a way to self-preserve your little stake at this life. Live radically for God who will take the hardest things and make them the most glorious. And the application for some of you is different. This is a promise for those of you who love God, who love his word, You love seeking him in prayer. You love coming here to his house and worshiping him. And you love hoping in that next wave of the discovery of his goodness. And it is a warning for those of you who don't. Suffering will happen. Your worldview will be tested. And there are no guarantees in the hopes of this world. What does the end of your story look like? Because if you don't believe in the whole story, you will get stuck in the gap where the details are black and you will get buried in the why and you will get burdened by the unknown and we are inviting you, we are imploring you on behalf of this God who loves you and he has brought you here with all of your baggage for such a time as this to give it to him and see what he will do to make your bad stuff good. Accept this God who loves you and wants to work your life into his story of goodness. And the application as we leave these doors, twofold. Jesus says that his followers are supposed to be light of this world. And I want all of us who are lovers of God, who believe we are part of his purpose to love this world, shine like light into a hopeless world. When you come across the suffering and the hard and the difficult and the trying and the hopeless, your neighbor is watching and your coworker is watching and your friend who you don't talk to is watching and the people who have hurt you are watching. Let your hope be an eager expectation of what God is going to do and don't give up until you get there. And let that hope shine before men so that you can point people more and more to the end of the story. 
Second application is that we're getting a head start on Thanksgiving here, whether you realize it or not. Because Thanksgiving really is a, is a sometimes an exercise in us trying to label good. If you've ever noticed that when we go around the table or when we take time in our own quiet way to thank God or just make thanks for what we're happy for, it's usually, it's by our default labeling, definitely thankful for this category, and I am not thankful for this. And so I give you a head start to your turkey dinner, and I implore you to thank God for everything. Thank him for the really tough season. Thank him for the stuff that is still not worked out. Thank him for the heartbreak. Thank him for the burden of all the stuff that hurts. Thank him for the things that you trust him beyond what you can see. Thank him for all, meaning all, in every area of your life. And he will show you, day by day and glory by glory, that next evidence of his goodness. There are no gaps. There are only seasons where we're still waiting for him to show us how good he is.